Okay. Awesome. Um, so yeah, thanks to uh, Shuei, who's the co-founder of Bite Medicine and King's College Radiology Society for hosting uh, this event. So it's a two-part series. So you've already had the first part where uh, Shuei's kind of gone through all the chest x-ray stuff. Um, and in part two, what I'm going to be doing is going through um, abdominal x-rays and also going to be focusing on upper limb um, radiology, specifically fact, uh, fracture focused and then we're going to be finishing off with uh, CT heads. So the main thing is that, is that I want you to understand um, how to describe um, common radiological findings, getting used to the phraseology that you should be using, the structure. Um, radiology is pretty much all about knowing your anatomy um, and specifically your relational anatomy. So once you know where something is in the body, then having that intuitive understanding of what's close by so that regardless of whatever image you're looking at, be it an X-ray, an MRI or a CT, you always have a rough idea as to what's going on around. And then it's really all about building up your intuitive foundational knowledge behind understanding what you're seeing why is it that it looks the way it is? And that's specific to each imaging modality. So we're mainly focusing on x-rays and I'm gonna try and keep it as much finals focused as I can. Uh, I appreciate sometimes I might go on a few uh, tangents, but I'm hoping I'll try and keep it as relevant as I can. Stop me if I say anything confusing. Uh, please use the chat function as much as possible. I want this to be um, as interactive as, uh, as I can. Um, I found when I was a student, the more I got involved, um, the, the more I learned, and particularly when I actually got stuff wrong, it, it actually lingered a lot longer. Um, so there's going to be a couple of slides where I'm going to ask somebody to unmute themselves and potentially present if you're if you're able. You do not have to turn on your video at all. Just just unmute yourselves and uh, throw up answers or uh, a bit of a presentation that we can uh, we can pick and dissect. So um, let's go on to the next slide. So specifically, what I want to do is start off with with abdominal imaging. So this is a plain radiograph um, of uh, a normal abdomen. And there's a couple of things I wanted to point out here. So let's see if my annotation tool uh, works. So I'm gonna point to some key structures. I just want you to uh, tell me in the chat or just by unmuting yourselves what you think this is. Good, yeah, so we've got liver there. So that's the liver, well done. Um, so, and then after that, what about this structure just here? Rib, is it anterior or posterior? So this is this is the yeah so this is the posterior rib exactly well done so you've got to remember so all this so this stuff that's coming around or curving around the side these are actually the anterior ribs and the reason why we lose them or lose focus of them is because around this point so these are the false ribs they become cartilaginous at this point and this is actually a fairly young patient the only time you'll be able to see the false ribs joining in is when there's actually calcification. So that was one of the other points I wanted to stress on this is that particularly with age, you get more and more calcification appearing in different places and that can help delineate various structures. So the bones are very dense so we can actually see them, but really in, in essence, these are the posterior ribs and actually these are the anterior ribs coming around and we can't really see here because it's cartilage. Um, so a couple of other things I wanted to point out. So when we're looking at this region, let's say we can divide this into quadrants, um, we can actually start to identify very structures. You've already looked at the right upper quadrant and the liver. Um, what do you think is going on here? So what structure do you think or structures do you think this represents? Good, so we've got a suggestion of gas level in the stomach. So do you guys think that this is just the stomach? Is this one entire structure or do you think there's actually another structure uh, underneath or above? So what about if I, so let's say, can you guys see this line there? Can everyone see that line? So I'm just talking about this line here. So I'll remove it so that you can actually see it. 
Not quite. So I agree. So this section here, so we've got two basically gaseous structures. One is here and one is just underneath here. So there's two linings that we can see. So I agree that this top one here, let's say that's the, that's the stomach. So it, it's a gas. So we're looking for a gas filled structure. So any of the solid viscera is going to have mostly this type of density here, just like we said with the liver. Um, but we're looking at a gas filled structure. So what, what gas filled structure do you think might be underlying the curvature of the stomach and going underneath here up towards the splenic flexure? Colon, exactly. This is the transverse colon. The only reason I wanted to bring this to your attention is, is because when we're looking at radiographs, we really are trying to figure out borders and, and lines that can point us towards various structures. So when you're looking at a radiograph, it's a 2D representation of a 3D structure. So everything's compressed into one. As x-rays pass through, obviously you have various thickness and densities of tissue. So it actually all blends into this kind of... Um, uh, mucky gray thing that you can see. But the only time you can actually delineate the uh, boundaries between structures is when there is a significant difference in density. Um, so for example, air is, is, is not very dense at all. So we can see it as more of a black structure. But then after that, if we look at the soft tissue, it's a bit more gray. So whenever you have the boundary between air and soft tissue, you get a you get a border there. And that means that there's some kind of structure there underlying. So we've got a lumen in here and we've got gas filled gas inside of it so then we have to try and use our knowledge and figure out okay well we're looking at so we're looking at a change in density so clearly there is a, a bordered structure here which region is it within so what could it likely represent and you won't get it right all the time so this is my main point abdominal x-rays because there's so much going on in such a compact volume um, it's very very difficult it can be very difficult to understand what's going on so really we only use it as a gross assessment of the bowels and yeah. Uh, the only time really that we can pick up on abnormalities is when things are significantly wrong and we'll go through some examples uh, in the bit so a couple of other structures i just want to get um uh, help you guys understand so is the spine also a bit curved so i think it's probably just the positioning uh, of the patient and the way they're positioned so it could just be that they've got a bit of a tilt but that's a good point that you've mentioned there is a, there is a slight tilt there um so one thing i want to go over so can you see there's this structure here that's curving, curving round. So there's there's a bit of a lucent line, and then there's this structure here that's underneath. What's this? Yeah. So that's the that's the kidney, exactly. And if you can believe me, there is also another central lucency inside, and that's because that you have the renal sinus fat. So fat is also is also very is not very dense at all. So I don't know if you guys can appreciate, but there's actually you probably won't be able to tell actually there is a there is a there is a faint line just here so this is subcutaneous fat and fat basically is not very dense at all so you've, you've got air which is the least least dense and then you've got fat uh, and then you start to get and then water and then soft tissue blood and then calcification and bone at the top end so what we basically have is any fatty structures are going to appear um, this sort of density, and you can actually see it here. So what structure do you think this is that's coming down? Yeah, so it's actually the descending, there's the descending colon. So uh, someone made a very interesting uh, comment about psoas. So this is actually the psoas muscle. Can you see this structure there? So if I remove it, you can see a line just running through there and then about here. So the reason why you can see these structures appearing, so the, the, the right kidney and the psoas muscle, is because they're retroperitoneal structures and there's actually a bit of fat surrounding them. And that's why you've got these fat planes. And these fat planes, and because I said that fat is not very dense and soft tissue is, is significantly denser, you've got a change in density and you can see the borders. So that's the psoas muscle, that's the kidney. And then overlying that, you can see the colon coming down. You can actually start to see the haustral patterns or the folds coming down. And then next to that, again, you've got a fat density there. The reason why this is important is because this is what we call the paracolic gutter. So the descending colon, the ascending colon, are what we also call retroperitoneal structures. So they're retroperitoneal, meaning that around them, again, we have this fat. And this fat, as you can see, this boundary, in, in young, thin patients, you can see this quite well. If, let's say, there was a collection 
um, around here, you'd actually get a blurring of the boundary here and you wouldn't be able to see this very well. So that might point you towards some kind of pathology, but you wouldn't use an X-ray to, to be uh, as the be all end all for that. Um, so let's move on to the next um, part. So in order to assess it, we've already kind of gone through, you're basically splitting it up into viscera and you're looking at uh, the bones. And with regards to the viscera, you're looking at the bowel and you basically try and trace as much as you can. You're not doing the full trace, it's absolutely impossible. The only things that will show up are, you know, when gas is filling it and normally in, the, in a resting state in a normal healthy person, the bowel, the small and the large bowel is relatively collapsed. So you'll just see vague pockets of air. Um, with the liver and the spleen, you only tend to see the spleen when it's really enlarged. Uh, otherwise, you don't really tend to see it. Um, and the liver, as we said, you can actually see quite well and you can see the liver edge underneath. The bones, you should really be requesting dedicated studies if you're suspecting bone fractures, because as we'll go through later on, to actually understand whether there's a fracture, we need to look at two views as a minimum. Um, so with uh, with bones, you can actually make out a lot of bony structures on the abdominal x-ray, and it does encompass the pelvis. Um, so it's, it's always good to look at the lower ribs, as we were doing before, the lumbar spine, and we're specifically looking at the, the vertebral height. So if the height is reduced relative to the other, the other vertebral bodies, then you're suspecting something called a wedge compression fracture. And then with regards to the pelvis and the hips, again, you're looking for any loosened lines or, or breaks in the cortex as you're following the bones around. Um, so the limitations, as I mentioned, is you, it's, it's quite difficult to pick up pathology. And really, if you are suspecting something, we normally go on to look at CT investigation, so CT abdomen and pelvis. So just a quick recap, so small and large bowel. Um, so, the comparison between the two, so small bowel is central, largely. It has what we call valvuli convenientes or clique circularis or circular folds. It's all the same thing. Um, they're typically bunched together very much so. And in comparison to the large bowel, it's peripheral. It frames the, the, the small bowel as we were tracing it. But just bear in mind, the transverse colon, as you can see here, is actually intraperitoneal. So similar to the bowel, it can flop down and actually form um, form quite a tortuous route, which is why it can be a bit difficult. So the only two fixed structures that you can normally see are the ascending colon and the descending colon. Does anyone know what other parts of the large bowel are uh, intraperitoneal? Yeah, so sigmoid colon, that's a good one. Anything else? And cecum, exactly. And the reason why that's relevant, as we'll go on to see in later on, is it's the intraperitoneal structures, the things that are attached to mesentery that are fluid and flexible and can twist. And because they can twist, they can cause obstruction. And specifically with regards to the sigmoid and the cecum, we think about volvulus. So large bowel, um, as I was mentioning, just to recap, it actually has something called haustra, um, so these are incomplete circular folds, which are more spaced apart. And just remember the location, as we said, peripheral. Um, so moving on to the next slide. So we've got a bit of trivia, and I think I've asked some of these questions already, but what do you think produces house strain in the colon, and why might we lose them? Why is it significant? So you can either write it in the chat or someone can unmute themselves and just give a, a brief explanation. I don't mind. Good. Yep. So we've got some good answers coming through. So, so what someone's saying that we lose house strain in edema, in IBD, um, and and actually that the circular and longitudinal muscles produce it. So very, very, yeah, it's very close. So you're losing them in inflammation. So essentially, the house strain is produced. So what you have is you've got three bands of longitudinal muscles, um, which are called the tinea coli, which sort of outline the bowel, and then you've got circular. Um, muscles as well. Now, what's happening is, is that these three bands of muscle, the tinea coli, are in a constant state of tension, and that tension can vary. But the most important thing is that the bowel itself um, is actually longer than the resting tension within the tinea coli, which means that the, the rest of the small bowel has to get bunched up. 
Um, that's why that that's what produces the um, the haustra. So it's the same way that you put a curtain net onto a string. So the, the string is a certain length, but when you put the curtain on the actual netting, it's actually quite long, so it has to be bunched up. So you've got loads of folds in between. So that's the reason why you actually get the house in between. And you do lose them in, in, in acute inflammation. And that's actually typically because what happens is when you've released a lot of nitric oxide, the smooth muscle relaxes. So the tenea coli and all of the muscles descend and they become paralytic. So that's why we, we, we get things like ileus and you actually lose, start to lose the pattern of, infl uh, of the house or pattern of the bowel. Um, in edema, it's interesting. So sometimes with edema, you get a different sign. So how have you, has any, have any of you heard of thumbprinting sign? I don't think I've got a picture of it, unfortunately, in my presentation, but have you heard of thumbprinting? Yeah. So with edema, you tend to get it in, um, you tend to get it in any inflammation. So UC is one of them, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, pseudomembranous colitis, all of these colitides, you can get edema, which sits between the mucosa and the submucosa, or in the submucosal layer. And that can, and that can contribute to a prominence um, around the haustral folds. And that's what we call thumbprinting sign. Um, so it makes the whole haustra seem a bit ill-defined and, and splodgy. Um, so that's basically why you get the, the, that's what you get in the edematous pattern. But when the edema progresses to a widespread state of inflammation throughout the entire bowel, you actually get an overall progressive distension and relaxation of the entire muscles. And so that's why um, you see the, uh, the losing of the haustral folds. And someone says, do you also see an epiglottitis? Yes, you do. So it's exactly the same concept. So you've got a focal bit of edema that's sitting in a structure and producing that, um, that bubbly pattern. Okay, so what are the upper limits of small and large bowel? So who knows what rule do we use? Three, six, nine, good. So what does three, six, nine actually represent? So what's the three, four? Small bowel, good. And the six is four. Good. And then what about the nine? Cecum, yeah. So cecum is still part of the large bowel, but it gets a special uh, special dimension. So we allow we allow for the cecum to be slightly larger than the rest of the large bowel. So essentially it's three centimeters is the upper limit of normal for small bowel. Um, six centimeters for large bowel, except for the cecum, which is nine centimeters. Anything beyond that, we start to think of pathological distension. So which parts of the small bowel has the highest concentration of valvuli convenientes? not got a response yet. So it's actually the jejunum. So the jejunum has the highest concentration of folds. And the reason why we have it, so the jejunum is just proxy. So we got the duodenum, then the jejunum, and then the ileum. So there's three parts of the small bowel. The, these valvuli convenientes, the reason why they exist is to increase the surface area, to slow the passage of food down um, as it transits through, to increase the amount of surface area for absorption of nutrients. And the jejunum being the most proximal part um, has a large role in the initial stage when the stomach um, uh, unloads the contents into the small bowel to actually go through that process of digestion, slow it down, and then absorb all of the stuff. Um, so that's it's the jejunum for number three. Small bowel is completely intraperitoneal, true or false? Fifty-fifty. Okay, someone said false. Um, why? Correct. Well done. Um, so do you know which parts? Almost, almost. So it's the second to the fourth. Um, and then when it becomes, when it turns into the jejunum, then it becomes uh, intraperitoneal again. Um, so uh, so about half of the duodenum essentially is the retroperitoneal. Um, and the second part of the duodenum is important for what reason? What do we see in the second part of the duodenum? What structure enters it? 
Not quite. So the pylorus is the last part of the stomach before it then becomes segment D1 and in D2 exactly. So you've got the, the pancreatic duct as well as the CVD. So both ducts enter um, into, the, into D2. So that's the reason why, why that part is important. Um, which parts of the large bowel intraperitoneal? We've already discussed this. Um, what does watershed area mean? So does anyone know what a watershed area mean when we talk about the colon? Correct. Reduced blood supply, absolutely. So we've got three main blood supplies to the GI system. So embryologically, we split this up into foregut, midgut, and hindgut. So the foregut, we're thinking about, um, so we're thinking about anything up to D2. Um, and then after D2, all the way up until two thirds, um, uh, up to the two thirds of the transverse colon, um, we've got the midgut. And then the distal third of the transverse colon all the way down to the rectum, we've got the hindgut. And yes, as you've correctly said, it's split into three main blood supplies. So the foregut is supplied by the celiac axis. The midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, and the hindgut is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. And where you basically have, so like I said, the transition from, let's say, the midgut um, to the hindgut, so where we've got that distal two-thirds of the transverse colon, you shift from superior mesenteric to inferior mesenteric, you've got a, a bit of area there where you haven't got a, um, a dedicated blood supply. These, reg these regions matter because in, in states of global hyperperfusion, let's say you've got a patient who's profoundly septic, um, you're going to get a relatively reduced blood supply here, and therefore these areas are more prone to becoming what we call colitic secondary to ischemia. So ischemic colitis. So if you ever see a, an SBA question in your papers which says which areas are most prone uh, to ischemic colitis, um, you have to think about the watershed regions and specifically the transition between midgut to hindgut. So that's the, the uh, distal um, two thirds of the colon, and also the transition between the midgut and uh, sorry the, the yeah the midgut and the inferior. I've said that haven't I? Sorry, I meant to say full gut and mid gut, and then mid gut and hind gut. So the, the distal two, two thirds of the transverse colon um, and also the sigmoid colon. So those two areas are most prone to um, uh, ischemia secondary to uh, global hyperperfusion. So we've got a case here um, that I just want you to have a look at. So it's an abdominal X-ray of a 45 year old female um, who basically is, it has presented with um, acute abdominal pain, distension, vomiting, past medical history of appendectomy to 10 years ago. And you're the foundation year doctor working in, in ED and you've just seen the patient and consultants asked, can you present your findings suggesting a diagnosis and a management plan? So does anyone know uh, what kind of structure you might follow? Um, so this is the part where I was hoping somebody might unmute themselves and have a, have a crack at it. Um, so just literally talk me through what you see and in an OSCE situation, what kind of structure uh, you might use to present this. So someone's saying BBC, so what does that mean? What does that refer to? Yeah, we'll be doing CT heads a bit late towards the end of the presentation. Bowel organs, bone calcification, good. Yep, so that's one way. So in this particular case, I want to think of, want you to think about the holistic presentation of the entire thing. So you're trying to package the radiological findings into the rest of the station. So you also want to give a, a, an overview of what's going on with the patient. So it's almost like an SBAR handover, if you guys have uh, come across SBAR before. So that's the kind of style I was thinking about. So I'll just walk you through it. Um, so in my structure, again, this is this is uh, more of a, a style that I've come to uh, come to use. But obviously, feel free to adapt, chop, and change. So this, I want you to go through initially by talking through the type of study, and then mention and then just summarize the patient demographic. So we'll say something like this is uh, an abdominal radiograph of a 45-year-old female who has presented with, and you talk through their main findings in that. 
And then after that, you mention any limitations that you have at this stage. So, you know, this study doesn't encompass a certain view or doesn't show this or whatever. Um, a description of what you see. So you don't want to dive into the diagnosis straight away. What you want to do is be just purely descriptive and talk about the, um, the main findings on there without saying, oh, I think this is. Um, and then after that, what and how you split that up is you, you, you talk about your positive findings and then you then you talk about your important negatives. At this stage, I want to then offer a probable diagnosis as well as narrowing it down further based off of any other clinical information or context you've been given. So that could be in the form of bloods, it could be in the form of history, it could be in the form of examination that you've just done. Um, so in this case, a relevant thing, and I'll, I'll show you an example, by the way. So the reason why I'm going through it quickly is because I've got an example um, which will pop up in a bit so you can have a read of that. Um, so in this particular case, the past medical history of an appendectomy um, uh, being something which is which is an important uh, important contextual finding. Um, so suggesting a couple of differential diagnoses at this point, if possible, and then suggesting comparison to any prior imaging, as well as then offering your next best management steps. So for this particular issue, did anyone did anyone pick up on the actual main finding? I can go back. So if you want to shout out the diagnosis, yep, someone said small bowel obstruction. That's PO, good. So let's just quickly go back and let me show you the example, just so that you have an idea as to what I mean by that, let's put it into practice. Good, someone said secondary to adhesions, exactly. So the way I would actually phrase this, so I would say this is an abdominal radiograph of a 45 year old female who has presented with acute onset vomiting with abdominal pain and distension. This study is overexposed and does not completely show the upper abdomen along with the diaphragm. Why do you think that's important? Why have I mentioned that as a limitation in this particular case? So specifically, I'm talking about the fact that we haven't got the good um, field of view encompassing the yeah, so someone said pneumoperitoneum, exactly, well done, good. So we normally use a rep chest x-rays because they actually cover the, the next step up. So they cover the all of the lung field as well as the diaphragm and the top of the liver. So you can actually see whether there's any air resting in between. So because we haven't got that, we have to rely on another sign that we might see. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so, so I've said basically, I've used that as a limitation, but I've said it does demonstrate, and this is where we're talking about pure description, no diagnosis. So we just say central distended bowel loops. I can also see valvuli convenientes, suggesting there's a small bowel. The large bowel, and this is important negatives now. So the, the large bowel appears normal. There's no gross evidence of pneumoperitoneum as evidenced by a lack of which sign. So what sign can you still use on this, potentially? It's not always clear, um, but there is one other sign that you can sometimes use. If anyone knows the name of it, Riggler's sign, Riggler's sign. Yeah, exactly the same thing, double bubble. Yeah, so all, do you know what that refers to? And I've got an image later on which exemplifies that. I've got like an exploded section which shows what Riggler's sign actually is, but um, if someone wants to quickly summarize it. Where the large bowel is on this image. Yeah, sure, one second. So it's interesting you say this. So we can't actually fully see the large bowel. We know, and the reason is because it's overexposed. It's an overexposed image, but if we did see large bowel, it would be worrying. So the fact that we can't see it, so normally, like I said, it will be along the frames and you'd see Haustra. So I have a case later on which shows. Um, large bowel obstruction specifically, and also large bowel and small bowel obstruction, you'd be able to see what I mean. So the fact that you have an absence of the large bowel, we assume by definition that it's collapsed um, and we can't see it. Like I said, abdominal x-rays are not perfect, um, but in this, the most important finding that we can see is central loops uh, of distended bowel with, with valvuli convenientes, meaning this is all likely to be a small bowel. So someone's mentioned that regular sign is basically air outside and inside the bowel exactly. So do you remember we were talking about borders and how when you have a dramatic change in, in density, you can see uh, lines on radiographs very well. So when you have pneumoperitoneum, we already know that we have air inside the small bowel 
uh, normally. And, and there, there's always going to be some element of air inside the bowel. When you have a perforation, um, that air can then leak over to the other side. So you now have air on both sides of the wall. And because air is significantly less dense, we can then actually see the border or the, or the wall of the small bowel. And that is basically what Rigler's sign is. It's that enhanced inherent contrast that allows us to visualize the small bowel wall in its entirety because we have gas on either side. Does that make sense? I hope I've explained that clearly. If you have any, if you if it doesn't make sense, let me know and I can have a go at rehashing the explanation. Good. Okay, so just moving on swiftly because I'm worried about time. We need to get through a lot. Um, so I so basically what we say is I would like to compare with any prior relevant imaging. So it's, yes, the diagnosis, these findings are in keeping with probable small bowel obstruction in the context of prior abdominal surgery. This may be secondary to adhesion. So this is referring to this point here. So offering a probable diagnosis, but narrowing it down further based on any clinical context you have. And then saying, okay, I'd like to compare with relevant imaging. And I would consider inserting an NG tube to decompress the bowel, IV fluids, and arranging an urgent surgical review with CT abdomen pelvis contrast. So in my, so I think this is a very comprehensive um, answer. And you can use this format for any plain film, any radiographic study, any, radi any imaging study to try and structure your answer to encompass the maximum amount. Because what I can definitely guarantee you is with OSCEs, it's all about your thought process. It's not just about the immediate diagnosis. So actually can set you off on the wrong foot. If you jump into a diagnosis and you get it wrong, um, then the examiner has a lot of questions in their mind as to how did they reach that answer? Why are they saying this? So if you actually go through a format where you're describing what you see and then reach your answer, um, it's going to be far more uh, in keeping with what they want to see, which is your exact thought process. So another note that I want to mention is they can sometimes uh, chuck in composite stations. Um, which is where they ask you to do a lot of different things in one go. So this might just be one element that you get given inside your station. An example I gave, um, and you might not have all of these, but you might have an, a certain uh, number of these. So you might go in, you get asked to perform an A2E assessment. While you're doing that, they give you the x-ray and they say, have a look at it, along with any other investigations. You also then might need to direct the nurse uh, who's alongside you to insert an NG tube, for example. Um, and then you might also have a drug chart on the table which says, oh, prescribe some fluids, by the way, and do the S-bar handover at the end. So I'm not sure exactly what the length of your stations are, but all I know is, is that we're generally speaking in medical schools, and I know this from UCL for a fact, um, that they move, they're moving towards composite stations more and more. So they get you to do a different a mixture of element of things. So just be careful with that. So um, what's the most common cause of small bowel obstruction in adults? Um, does anyone know? So it's actually adhesions, good. Um, can you think of any other causes? Hernia, very good, very, very good. Yeah, so malign someone said malignancy. Interestingly speaking, the most common malignancy of the small bowel is actually lymphoma. And lymphoma doesn't have uh, what we call a desmoplastic reaction to it. It doesn't have a lot of fibrotic components to it. So typically, um, small bowel is, you don't get small, small bowel obstruction secondary to um, an intrinsic cancer, just, just by virtue of the fact that the most common small bowel malignancy is a lymphoma, which doesn't cause, uh, which typically doesn't cause small bowel obstruction. But when you have a, another cancer nearby, and if that causes extra luminal compression, that can almost certainly cause small bowel obstruction. So that's a good, uh, a good thought. Um, and then there's a few, if, I don't know if anybody knows anything else, um, but those, yeah, I would say those are the top ones. Someone said intersusception. So I'm actually gonna go over and uh, I'm just gonna load up all the questions, hang on a second. So yeah, number four is talking about the pediatric population. Intersusception is a very common um, cause of, um, in, uh, of small bowel obstruction in the pediatric population. And do you know secondary to what main thing? So I've written there, what, what is the most common congenital uh, anomaly in, in the pediatric population that lead that can lead to interception, small bowel obstruction? Not quite, not quite, no. 
Exactly. So someone said Meckel's diverticulum. That is the correct answer. So Meckel's diverticulum is just a remnant bit. Um, just how you've got various ligamentous structures anchoring your viscera to the anterior abdominal wall. An example being, for example, the falciform ligament for the liver that anchors it to the anterior abdominal wall. So the same way you also have the vitelline duct, which is a, a remnant fibrous tissue, which at which go, which basically anchors the small bowel to the anterior abdominal wall and it regresses. Um, but when you get incomplete regression, you get something called a Meckel's diverticulum. Um, which is actually just about two cent roughly two centimeters um, proximal from the ileocecal junction. And in, it, it affects about 2% of the population. So it's the rule of twos. Um, and it can actually most commonly affects the age of two. <laughs> and it can twist on its axis and cause obstruction, or it can be an anchoring point for intersusception. Um, so what, one thing I think I didn't talk about is, yeah, how do you assess phenema peritoneum? We've already gone through this. So basically free air underneath the diaphragm as well as regular sign is another one. So very quickly, what's going on here? Or what are the key signs? Just, just throw some stuff out. So you're someone saying large bowel obstruction, someone saying toxic megacolon. And we've got an interesting wrigglers there as well. Lead piping, good. So these are all really good suggestions. So what we can see is we've clearly got Haustra here, then all of a sudden we lose our Haustra, and then we will, and that's literally going all the way from the transverse colon and down to the ascending colon. If you guys know of any pathology or any pathological condition which has such a smooth, um, so we said it typically happens secondary, so it can happen to secondary inflammation, right? So yeah, so you see ulcerative colitis is something that typically has a continuous inflammatory pattern extending from the rectum, starts at the rectum, and then it affects the mucosa continuously all the way through and it tracks back. So someone also mentioned lead piping. So lead piping, again, is something that we typically see uh, in terms of loss of haustration, but we talk about it in the context of, it, more in the context of chronic. Um, so uh, inflammatory states in both in the acute sense and the uh, chronic sense can contribute to loss of haustration. In the chronic sense, what's actually happening is, is that we have atrophy of the colon and thickening of the muscularis mucosa, which shortens the length of the bowel. So relative to the tinea coli, it's basically the same length. So there's no, there's no bunching up of the, of the colon. That's the main reason why in, in chronic, disease you get loss of haustration um, and in acute stages it's that pathological distension and, in, and inflammation which leads to the relaxation of the muscles so here i agree there is a, a big gap here in between here and here someone mentioned wrigglers i found that interesting because i do agree that there's a thickening that you're probably referring to this uh the fact that you can see the bowel wall here quite clearly this is actually something that we call um this is happening because of two phenomena one is that you've got thickening of the bowel wall itself, secondary to edema. So there's, there's edema here as well. But because there's no horstration, we're not seeing that classic thumbprinting because we've lost that because it's a very severe inflammation. Um, and you've also got bowel underneath it, which is overlapping. So when you have two bowel walls that are overlapping, you can actually get also a, a thickening of the bowel. And all of these things we call pseudo wrigglers. So these are the, that creates the impression of wrigglers, which really isn't there. And it just adds to this kind of um, frustration of how difficult x-rays can be, particularly the abdomen to interpret. But one thing I would definitely agree with is we have loss of haustration going all the way from the sigmoid through to the transverse colon. So the thing that we must think about is, a, is an inflammatory ascending pathology, specifically ulcerative colitis, and someone mentioned toxic megacolon, and I completely agree. So does anyone know what toxic megacolon actually is? How do you diagnose toxic megacolon? Can you just diagnose it based off of this radiograph alone? Or is it a, is it a clinical thing? Good. Someone said clinical. I agree. So does anyone know what the additional clinical findings are? So the radiographic findings that we need to look at is, yeah, so loss of loss of haustration, distended bowel, so more than six centimetres. Um, so someone's mentioned shock. Good. Um, so shock is one of them. Anything else? Fever is very important. So a fever of more than 38 degrees. Also tachycardia, more than 120. 
electrolyte disturbances, but the other one that is also is a leukocytosis. So we're looking at inflammatory, exactly, white cell count. So we're looking at a leukocytosis more than, I think, 10.5. Um, so, so basically fever more than 38, tachycardia, white cells more than 10.5. And then in addition to that, the fact that you have an overall systemic upset, so hypotension, altered mental state, this is what accompanies a diagnosis of toxic megacolon. You can't just say that based off of a plain film alone. So that was the main thing I wanted to get you guys to uh, think about. Uh, spot diagnosis, uh, what do you think this is? And what sign is this? Sigmoid lobulus coffee bean sign, good, exactly. So it's the coffee bean sign. Um, and this basically uh, refers to sigmoid volvius. I'm just going to swiftly move on. What do you think this is in comparison? Good, sequel volvulus. So does anyone know the main, yeah, so someone said embryo sign, exactly. So you've got the kind of classic imaging patterns that we tend to see. Does anyone know of any other ways we distinguish between or can distinguish between sequel volvulus and sigmoid volvulus other than the imaging findings? Someone said direction. So classically, what we say is that sequel volvulus basically starts in the uh, in the right lower quadrant and extends diagonally upwards into the left upper quadrant. Um, and then the sigmoid does it the other way. So that's one way, but it doesn't always hold true. Um, th there's another sign that we can see with sequel volvulus. It's not actually present on this one, um, but we do typically see it with sequel volvulus that we don't see it with sigmoid as much. So it's actually, because uh, someone, no one's mentioned yet, we need to move on. So it's a it's small bowel obstruction. So the fact that the sequel, remember that your ileocecal valve, so you're, you're, you're very close to your ileum, aren't you, with your at, at the sequel pole. So if you have a twisting about that axis and you've got back pressure going through, where is it going to go? So it can, it can typically go back into the small bowel. So you might also see lots of distended small bowel. Um, interesting point to note is that there's two types of sequel volvuli. This is going a bit, uh, further than what you need to know. But one is called the sequel bascule, which is where it literally just flips up on itself. And in that particular case, it's like a closed loop obstruction of the cecum. So it doesn't involve the ileum at all. So you don't see it. So this is likely to represent a sequel bascule, which happens in 10% of cases. But you've also got in the other 90%, you've basically got where it literally just has a twist on its mesentery. And in that particular case, it actually had, leads to a back pressure through the ileum uh, and the small bowel, and you can get small bowel obstruction as well. Okay, does anyone know what this is? A ureter extent. Good, does everyone agree? So we've basically got a structure that's going from in the region of where we said the kidney would lie going down into the bladder. So I agree, this is a ureter extent. And typically we place these in various different situations to alleviate the pressure between the renal pelvis and the bladder. And in a, a case where that might happen is for example, renal stones. So if you have renal stones, which are causing upstream dilatation of the ureters, we sometimes want an interval means of decompressing it. Interestingly, the stones will typically remain there and you've just inserted the strength stent. You can either go antegrade, so you can insert it here, or you can go retrograde. Um, it doesn't really matter. But the point is, is that you allow the system to decompress. You also allow the system to, um, uh, so normally in the acute state, there's actually quite a lot of an inflammation around the stone. So you give that time to settle and then the urologist can go in and remove the stones. So it's normally an, an interval thing that we do um, to try and decompress. But there's loads of other reasons why we might put it in. Uh, interestingly, we don't put it in when there's a concomitant um, urinary tract infection. And the reason is because at this level here where you've got the dome of the bladder, you've got the VUJ. And that's actually a one-way valve. When you put this in, you actually allow reflux to go, you, you allow for reflux to happen. And if there is a, an infection, you can allow that to bypass and go up to the kidneys. It's just an interesting side point I thought I'd throw in there. Um, okay, what do you think this case is? So can you see, uh, what can you see here? Can you see small bowel? Just say yes or no. Distended small bowel. And can you see distended large bowel? 
Yeah, you can. So remember I said it frames the bowel. It's very difficult to see, and this is what I was saying, but this this is actually large bowel because you can see that house strut, that, that doesn't actually cross the full length. But the central loops, I don't know if you can make this out on, on the resolution that I've got in the study, but you can actually see the valvular convenientis going through. And there's just too much going on in the center for this just to be large bowel. So there's definitely large bowel going through in the periphery. And there's also, I'll try and point out, can you see this segment? So there's, there's lots of lines going through. So there's definitely small bowel and there's also large bowel. So you've got both. So what is this typically secondary to? Why might you get um, widespread bowel obstruction, both small and large bowel? What's the most common cause? So someone said adhesions, anything else? cancer so all of these things so essentially if you if, it, if it's left normally if you have rectal cancer or something like that you'll get colonic distension and then if it's really bad it will then progress through into the ileum remember that the ileocecal valve is also uh, permits a one-way direction so it's got to be pretty bad to allow it to then go back up um, so it can happen, but by that point, we normally have decompressed the bowel. So it's not really uh, something that we see. But we do see this with paralytic ileus. So ileus, exactly, pseudo obstruction. Well done. Well done. So pseudo obstruction is basically where you don't have a, a mechanical obstruction. So you don't have a, an exact transition point, but the entire bowel is distended because of its paralytic nature. So it just acutely just becomes, it says, I don't want to have, I don't want to uh, go through any more peristalsis, any more motion. Uh, I'm just going to sit there. And that's what happens. And basically, whenever you eat food, you can imagine nothing gets pushed through because it's a dynamic. Um, so the entire length of the small and large bowel can become distended in, in the states of pseudo obstruction, which can happen post-op because you've manhandled the bowel. So it, it, it's like a, an iatrogenic inflammation of the bowels, or it can happen in states of profound sepsis. Okay, this is Riddler sign, guys. So this is just explaining that you've got an enhancement of the actual bowel wall itself because you've got air on both sides. Um, again, look how much I've had to enhance this up to get you to, to see that. But this is essentially um, the main, this is what Riddler sign looks like. So someone's saying, can this happen in Hirschsprungs? So Hirschsprungs is basically a form, yeah, you, it can happen because it's essentially, but it's a focal segment of paralysis that you get. Um, where that, that bit of bowel doesn't move. Um, so Hirschsprungs, again, is, is more of a congenital thing where you don't develop the, the myosinus and the myenteric plexus within the bowel to then stimulate um, the, the nervous, uh, the contraction of the bowel. So that's another cause. Um, but this ileus we're talking about more of a kind of broad, a widespread thing across all the whole bowel segments. So I'm going to uh, rush through these because, um, and I think we've answered most of them anyway. So sequel valvulus is more common than sigmoid. So sigmoid is more common. Sigmoid valvulus is far more common than sequel. Um, if you see a patient with acute febrile dilal illness with, and a distended abdomen, we spoke about this in the last case, so you want to rule out toxic megacolon. Um, and if positive, how would you manage this? What must you avoid? So I will, I will pitch this through to you guys. So if you have someone with diagnosed toxic megacolon, um, what do you want to avoid doing in terms of clinical management that you might do, say, for someone with an uncomplicated UC or Crohn's? Not quite, but I, I, I understand your point about the steroids. So the steroids, if it's an infective illness, you don't give steroids. But if it's non-infective and it is all secondary inflammation, you do give steroids. So not quite. Uh, someone's mentioned endoscopy. Good. You don't scope. Never scope a patient with toxic megacolon because the tissue is far too friable. So you will almost certainly call perforation. OK. Um, someone said, could you repeat that? What, uh, repeat what exactly? Sorry. Oh, the question. So basically, if you have a patient with toxic megacolon, um, what do you definitely want to avoid doing that you otherwise might do in a normal UC or Crohn's patient? And the answer is that you don't want to scope them. Um, you do give them you do give them antibiotics if it's an infective illness. If it's purely if you've ruled out infection, and you think this is all secondary to um, inflammatory. So a progression of UC, then you would give uh, steroids. So let's move on to upper limb uh, 
So I don't know if you can see here, we, we go through a slightly different approach here with, with, with bones. Essentially, what we want to do is be as descriptive as we can, um, but we don't want to waffle on for too long. So the main, I have a parameter approach where I start with the basics. So I say, okay, which side are we looking at? Is it the, the left or the right? Um, which bones specifically? And you've got a mixture of bones. You've got long bones and short bones. And then you're describing the area of, of the bone. And this is where it's, you can use different nomenclature. So you can either use um, this sort of uh, format where you've got diaphysis, metaphysis, and epiphysis. So all of this is in relation to the physis, which is the growth plate, um, which as we all know, fuses at puberty, but it allows for the bone to grow in that in the axial direction. The metaphysis is describing the, the bit just underneath the physis or the growth plate, the small part there. The epiphysis is the bit above and the diaphysis is the entire length in between. So you can imagine that with long bones, um, it's going to be quite difficult if you've got a fracture somewhere here or here, because the diaphysis is so big and it's encompassing about 70 to 80% of the bone, of the long bone, how do you accurately describe where along it is? So what we do is we divide the bone long bones typically into thirds and then we can say right so it's affecting the distal third middle third or proximal third so that's one way of describing the area of the bone that's affected then what we want to do is describe the type of fracture so i've got a few um uh, things over here that can help you understand that so a transverse fracture is just straight across Spiral fracture, as in the name, is when it goes like a staircase down, a spiral staircase down across. You've either got a commutative fracture, which basically means anything two or more parts. So a commutative fracture could be very commutative or it could be a little bit commutative. We, we don't tend to say that in our reports and we just say if it's commutative or not. But just for your understanding, it's basically two or more fragments. So it could be minimally or, or severely commutative. You can have something which is impacted. So that means any fracture line, um, but the bones have just gone into each other without displacement, um, and they've just gone in uh, and shortened the length of the bone. Or you have something called green stick. This is almost entirely seen in the pediatric population, and it's where you only see a fracture on one side of the cortex. It's incomplete, and the rest of the bone is bending across or, or the other way. So it's almost as if you're literally trying to um, break a set of twigs, and you've got a fracture line that basically goes along the side where you've got the displacement, but the other side is the cortex is maintained. And then you have an oblique fracture, which is basically similar to a spiral fracture, but just a diagonal line straight through. The, the, the other thing that we want to talk about is whether it's displaced, undisplaced, um, and, and to what degree. So the reason why this is important is because bones that are completely offended, so we, we, we say that as complete displacement, are often, often unstable and require um, open reduction in internal fixation, typically speaking. Um, when bones are a little bit displaced and we don't think we've lost too much of height on the bone, then we can actually just reduce them um, depending on what other injuries uh, have happened. And we can just uh, adopt a more conservative management. So the level of displacement is, is, is quite often uh, important to comment on. So just some trivia before we go into some examples. So what is the minimum number of views we must uh, have when we're looking at this? So everyone's good. So everyone's quick to respond there too. Well done. So it's because when you look at one plane, you can't tell if there's a shift in the axis of that plane. So if we're looking at an anterior posterior view, we don't know if there's a shift um, in that uh, frame of reference. So we need to then look at the lateral view to be able to understand whether there is a displacement of that fracture or not. Um, and sometimes you can have more than two views. So does anyone know of a specific series that we take for a bone where we have at least, I would say, four views as a minimum? Scaphoid, well done, really well done. So scaphoid is a small bone in the wrist which carries a lot of litigation with it because of how serious the injury could be if you don't pick it up early. So we try and take many views of that, of that bone to try and understand whether we can see a fracture or not. Um, we'll go on to that. There's, I think I have a case of that as well. Um, so when, when we describe angulation displacement, so by default, what segment of the bone are we, um, are we talking about? Is it the proximal or the distal? So it's actually the distal. Yeah, 
it's just the way that exactly with respect to the proximal. So, uh, so you don't need to always say it. So you don't always need to say, so I think there is a displacement of the distal fragment. So by default, when you say there is dorsal angulation, what we're referring to is the distal segment. So I thought I'd, I'd um, mention that because it can get a bit confusing when you see these reports and you're like, well, he hasn't really mentioned which part it is. Um, so that's why it's because it's by default, it's referring to the distal. So what is the most commonly um, dislocated joint in the body? Good. And without further ado, let's talk about um, shoulder. So before, so it says, what are some techniques? I've added in another question. I didn't even realize. What's the, what are some techniques we can use to spot fractures? So before we go on to shoulder, um, what techniques can we use to spot fractures? So how would you assess it if you had a, a radiograph in front of you? Um, how do you think you'd start to go by looking at so good someone's mentioned diffusion so that's an, an indirect sign and good follow the contour exactly so that's the direct sign that we look for so we trace the contour of the bone in its entirety and then we look for whether there is a disruption in the cortex where you see one you then try and trace that across and you see if you can find an abnormal lucency the caveat to that is just remember, because I said with compressing a 3D structure into a 2D space, you can get a lot of artifacts. So skin folds, for example, you will get a line that just randomly goes across and like, I think that's a fracture. You're following the cortex along. Is that a break? Not sure. So if you've got a line that's extending through the bone and beyond it, it's most likely to be artifactual, probably a skin fold or something or like a palm crease if you're looking at the hand. Um, so these things do show up in your radiograph, so you have to be really, really careful. So you're looking for a break in the contour in the cortex of the bone, followed by a line that is maintained within um, the bone itself. So it could be complete or it could be partial. Um, and someone also mentioned symmetry, which I also agree with. So if you have the luxury of comparing to the other side, then comparing both is really important. But sometimes you don't have that. Um, the other thing is you look at both views always. So never uh, try and uh, rule out a fracture on just one view. So if anyone does give you one view, tell them. And so let's say in an OSCE station or an SBA, you say you, you get given one view and it says, can you rule out a fracture? The answer is no, because you need a second view. Um, so these indirect signs I'm also interested in. So someone mentioned diffusion. So that's a reactive change. Um, which I completely agree with. And these effusions can also displace structures. So if they're significant, they can displace things like fat or muscle around it. Um, so sometimes you can see that in your, in your, in your uh, radiographs. So very quickly going through, uh, how am I doing for time? Not very well, unfortunately. So there's so much to cover. I knew this would happen. Um, so does anyone want to have a quick crack at uh, what number one is? Clavicle, number two. So number two is your coracoid process. Okay, good, yeah, coracoid. Number three is your uh, acromion. Number, th number four. is your glenoid. Yeah. Number five, I'm just going to go through, this is an obvious one. So this is going to be, yeah, the hum head of the humerus, exactly. Um, and then you've got number six, which is just a rib, uh, posterior rib, remember. Um, and then you've got the shaft and the dafts of the humor. Okay. So I'm um, the reason why I'm quickly going through this, I'm really sorry, is because we have, we have uh, so many cases to talk about. So this, um, how would you just overall describe this fracture? What type of fracture is this? Where is it? And specifically, what word would you use to describe it? The number one word that you would use? Good, comminuted, well done. That's the one I'm looking for. So this is a pretty severely comminuted fracture. These typically happen in elderly patients, even with low grade energy injuries. Um, if, it, if this was a young patient, it's gotta be pretty high energy to cause that type of, this type of fracture. 
Um, the, is there any other thing? So is it impacted? It's a good question. We don't know. There probably is a little bit of impaction, but the fact that we can see this kind of lucent line going through maybe suggests that there's not. Sometimes when it's impacted, what you see is you see a band of sclerosis, and that's because of the two bones overlapping each other. On here, probably not, but just by virtue of the fact that it's commutated, I probably wouldn't comment on that. Okay. Um, is there's one other thing that we look at when we have when we have a fracture? Um, what other thing are we trying to look at and for which we need another view for? So one thing is whether the actual fracture is displaced. What, what other thing are we looking at? And someone mentioned angulation. So angulation displacement, similar thing. Is there any other um, feature that you want to assess? Dislocation, very good. So let's go through this case. Um, so is this enough for you to for, for you to diagnose whether what type of dislocation this is. How many, how many types of dislocations do we have? Good, someone's mentioned two views, good. Um, so we do need two views. Um, what um, different types of dislocation, posterior, anterior, good. And actually there's a, the third type which is just an inferior, but typically your anterior dislocations are inferior. So you get anterior inferior dislocation, but broadly speaking, yeah, posterior and anterior. So we can't tell which one this is just based off of this. So we have a look at something called a Y view. And what this is, is looking at the shoulder laterally head on. And what you find is you've essentially got the rib cage here. So that means that this is gonna be anterior. And this segment is posterior. And the scapula, this is the blade of the scapula. And what you've got is the, cor the coracoid process pointing this way and you've got the, uh, the acromion pointing the other way. And what you find is that you form a Y. And in the center of that Y, just here, is where you expect your glenoid fossa to be, and that's where you expect your, the center of the humeral head to be. So if it's, if it's uh, located in this direction, this is an anterior dislocation. It's really simple. Um, and if this is this way, it's a posterior dislocation. So that's all it is to it. Does everybody understand that? Awesome. Um, so what do you guys think about this? From this, would you say that there is a dislocation at all? And if so, why? And if not, why not? So if someone said no, but two views, exactly, good. Um, so look at the side view. But so is there anyone who thinks there might still be a, a dislocation? You can probably tell with the way I'm wording that question that I'm getting you to say, uh, yeah, well done. Really glad you picked up on that. So it's called the light bulb sign. It is rotated, correct. Um, so there, this is this is the um, this is the light bulb sign that you see. And let me just pull up the um, so the reason. So can you see here what's going on? So we've got the Y view. Yeah, posterior dislocation exactly. This is really to show you how difficult it is. Um, to pick up a posterior dislocation on an AP view. Because of the fact that when you have, like I said, when you have an anterior dislocation, there's normally an inferior translation of the humeral head as well. With posterior dislocation, you don't tend to get that. So on the AP view, it looks like it's very much in the axis. Um, so this is the only way we can really tell from this. It's very subtle, but it's the fact that your, this is actually your greater, your lesser and greater tubercles here. These should be um, rotated out this way. The fact that you can see a very flat facing um, uh, thing in front of you with the shaft coming down implies that this is rotated. And that normally means um, that there is some element of, that there's probably a posterior dislocation. This is just another image, which is slightly higher quality to show you. Um, the light bulb sign, and we've already talked through what this represents. So does anyone know what's going on here? Fracture of what? So someone said depression fracture. Um, of the head of the humerus, really good. Um, so can everybody see this? So that is what you guys, I presume, are talking about. So this is the impacted or the depression fracture on the head of the humerus. We expect this to be fairly well-rounded, yeah? Um, and then where else can you see a fracture? So someone said avulsion, where, whereabouts are you thinking about? 
what anatomical structure. So there is another fracture on here. And it's this one here. I don't know if anybody picked that up. So does anyone know the names of these fractures? They have an eponymous name and they're associated with something. Um, okay, uh, one begins with B and one begins with H. This type of fracture begins with B and this type of fracture begins with um, H. So do you know why you might get this type of fracture pattern? First of all, not quite. So these are the common fractures that happen post dislocation. So it's really, really important to do radiographs after reduction. So once you've done your reduction, because normally on the acute dislocation radiographs, you don't see any fractures most often. I think it's like 40% of the time you miss them. So you do a post reduction x-ray and what you find sometimes is that you see where, for example, can you imagine if this slips down anteriorly, what it does is this element where you've got the just before the tubercle, it bangs into this segment here. So that causes a depression fracture here and it also knocks off this bit of bone there. So normally with anterior dislocations, as this thing slips down, what you find is that you get an impacted fracture of the head of the humerus along with a fractured segment of the glenoid, the inferior glenoid. So this is known as a Bankart's lesion, and this is known as a Hill-Sachs lesion. I don't know if you've ever come across that before. Um, so I'm only addressing these just in case you get random sort of, you know, one point SBA questions, which is like, what do you think this is in a data interpretation uh, question? Um, Okay, I'm gonna skip past this, guys, because that's uh, so. Just this is just um, a recap of showing the hill sacs and the Bankart's lesion. Um, what's the most obvious abnormality here? Got a bit of silence in the chat. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna tell you. Um, so normally, uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, okay, so exactly. So you, it's not a it's not quite a dislocation, but what you have, what you should see, this is the clavicle, this is the acromion. These should be level with each other, but this clavicle is significantly raised um beyond the level of the acromion. Um, it's not actually a fracture, there's meant to be a bit of a gap in between there. If there was a distal third of clavic a clavicle fracture, you sometimes see it around here, you can get it in the middle, but it's typically the distal third. So this is just a disruption of the ACJ joint, so the acromion clavicle, exactly. So the, it's the ligamentous structures that are holding the acromion and the clavicle together, which is called the acromioclavicular joint. And sometimes with injuries in young patients, especially when they have a fall on the outstretched hand, they might not have a fracture of the humerus, but what it does translate to is uh, a displacement or a disruption of the ligament that's holding these two structures together. That's just something I wanted to show you. Um, so which type of shoulder dislocation is the most common? Well done. It's markedly common. It's like 90% almost. Um, which, um, uh, what's the, why is it important to do post-reduction? So we've mentioned because you can miss fractures. Um, and then, yeah, so I've just got it here. Light bulb sign is posterior dislocation due to internal rotation of the humerus, um, sorry, is posterior, no, 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 anterior is more common. So, yeah, so anterior is more common, anterior is the most common by far, okay? And then why is it important to do post-reduction? We've gone through it, and this is just a key summary, sorry, of these points, so all the stuff that we just spoke about, and um, feel free to take um, screenshots if you want, because we're going to have to move through things uh, quite quickly. Um, so with the elbow, I'm thinking what I might do is skip this, actually, if um, I don't know if uh, Shweb's still on. Uh, do you want me, how much time do you do you give me? Do you gift me? Um, because I'm thinking I might skip to uh, CT heads. Hey, Hassan, yeah, I'm still around. Yeah, I think probably, yeah, crack, probably crack on with CT heads. Let's do it. Yeah, well, so guys, we'll probably have to come through. Uh, we'll have to do this a bit later. Um, unfortunately, there was just so much to prepare and go through, unfortunately. So, 
Um, CT heads, um, a quick recap of the anatomy. So um, we have four different main regions. So we've got the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital lobe. The two main fissures I want you guys to remember is your lateral fissure, which is your sylvian fissure, and your central sulcus. And the reason is because your lateral fissure or your sylvian, uh, sylvian fissure, this separates the temporal lobe um, from the frontal lobe and the, and the parietal lobe. And then the central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And the reason why the central sulcus is important is because just anterior to this, so along here, is where you've got your primary motor cortex, and just posteriorly, you've got your primary somatosensory cortex. So this is the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. So the postcentral gyrus being the one in the parietal lobe, your somatosensory cortex, and your central, your post, your precentral one being your motor cortex. This one is slightly more difficult to make out, um, but these two fissures I want you to uh, keep in mind. The other thing is looking at the vascular territories of the brain. So broadly speaking, we've got um, two main systems that supply the brain. We've got the posterior circulation um, being coming from the vertebra bacilla um, elements of it, which is actually running up through the spine. So your vertebral arteries are directly coming off, um, running up the, the length of the cervical spine, and then curling around the back and coming together to form the basilar artery, which then runs up the pons. And um, that contributes mostly to the posterior elements of the circulation. And then you have your internal carotid, which forms the anterior circulation. And that's talking about the middle cerebral artery as well as the anterior cerebral artery. Where those two circulations meet, we call the circle of Willis. Um, and you have uh, various arteries that join them at the center. Um, and I'll try and show you that a bit later on. And this is just an, an, an element to show you the, um, the ventricles and the structure of them. It's very complicated. The only things I want you to remember is, is that the lateral ventricles are huge structures that basically arch around in a C pattern. Um, and they have an anterior and a posterior horn. Um, and then in between them, in the midline, you've got one third ventricle. And then that goes down through into the cerebral aqueduct and then forms the fourth ventricle. And the reason why I mention this is because this is not a closed system. Um, you have holes that come off and actually allow the CSF to then articulate throughout the brain. Um, does anyone know in what space? Just to keep you guys still engaged, because I don't want to lose you. Subarachnoid, good, yeah. So in the subarachnoid space, and then it gets absorbed back into the dural venous sinuses um, through uh, something called the arachnoid granulations, okay? So you have a constant circulation of CSF, which basically cushions the brain inside uh, and prevents it from uh, significant injury. So, and it's also a nutrition uh, element as well. Um, so what we have, uh, very quickly to recap, is the layers of the brain. So we've got the scalp, the periosteum, then we've got um, just underneath here, the three main layers of the brain that I want you guys to remember, which is, um, your dura mater, your subarachnoid, or your your and your pia mater, and then in between them you've got you've got spaces. Um, so the spaces that I want you guys to remember is first of all, can you see that the dura is adhered to the inner table of the bone? So that the layer just underneath um, the skull bone is the dura. Now, one thing that I think a lot of people tend to misunderstand, you know, where we when we talk about dural venous sinuses. So all that is, is an, un, uh, an unfolding of two, the dura essentially is actually two layers. Um, you've actually got um, the layer which is adhered to the bone, and then you've got um, a layer which is adhered to the brain. And they separate out. So this, uh, this space where you get the uh, dural venous sinuses is actually called the intradural space, intradural, so between the dura. Um, just underneath the dura, um, what layer do we have? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we have the arachnoid, and then after that, we have what layer? Pia, exactly. So underneath, so in between the dura and the arachnoid, we've got the subdural space, and in between the arachnoid and the pia, we've got the subarachnoid space. 
Um, so that's why I wanted to stress those two, because a lot of people say, well, where exactly is the blood in the dural venous sinuses sitting? And it's actually the fact that the dura itself is formed of two layers and it separates out in the midline and various other structures um, to create that. OK, so here, the main thing I want to highlight is this region here. This is the weakest part of the cranium. So you can you see you've got all the sutures converging? This is called the terian. The terian, exactly, well done. So the terian is really weak, and there's a, a key artery that runs up just underneath it. Does anyone know what artery that is? Middle meningeal, fantastic. So the middle meningeal is a branch of the maxillary artery that runs up through the foramen spinosum just underneath the terian. If you give a massive blow to the head at this level, you can rupture the middle meningeal artery, cause a fracture here, and that can lead to what type of hemorrhage? An extra dural hemorrhage, perfect. And we'll go through cases, I'll explain the differences between them. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, how do you define and classify strokes very quickly? So even more basic than that, even more basic than what you guys are thinking. So you guys are going on another level, which is very good. Um, hem exactly, hemorrhagic and ischemic. So you've got hemorrhagic strokes and ischemic strokes. Ischemic strokes represent 85% and hemorrhagic is around 15%. Um, on a CT head, what are we trying to rule out, ischemic or hemorrhagic? Good, I'm glad you got that one right. So yeah, we're only trying to mainly rule out hemorrhage. The reason is in their initial pathway when they present to A&E, the reason why we wanna rule out hemorrhage is because if it is a purely ischemic stroke and they're within the, the time window, um, then uh, we need to give them thrombolysis. So thrombolysis, we can only do, if, if they've already got a massive hemorrhage, you don't wanna thrombolyze them because that means it will make the situation a hell of a lot worse. Um, so that's the main reason why we do uh, a CT head. And the reason is because uh, acute blood is hyper dense. So it's very easy to see. Ischemic strokes, unfortunately, are not so easy to pick up. There are a few subtle signs that we'll talk about, but it's not very uh, easy. And that's why I've got my next question, um, which is which modality is most sensitive for ischemic stroke? MRI, perfect. So later on, they'll probably have an MRI, but it's actually a clinical decision. If they think based off of the NIHSS scoring system or whatever criteria they use in, in the hospital, different teams use different scoring systems, um, but the most common one is the NIHSS score. Uh, if they think there is significant risk of, of this being a, a stroke, they will do a CT head, they rule out hemorrhage, and then they thrombolize if they're provided that they're within the window. If you've also got services such as thrombectomy services close by and you're in within the window that satisfies that, you can also refer them over to get a thrombectomy done, but they're far and few between. Uh, between. So the reason why, so I've, I've mentioned the question here, do we give contrast while scanning these patients? Does anyone, does anyone want to have a guess? Do we or do we not? No, good. And the reason why, like I said, is because blood itself is your inherent contrast. What you're trying to see is, is there blood where it shouldn't be? So if we give contrast, we're going to complicate that picture because we'll see lots of other bright foci on our scan and it will complicate things too much. So we're trying to, in the initial case, we just want to see uh, whether there is a hemorrhage so we don't give contrast. What subsequent imaging would you consider in your stroke workup? So this is important for your SB and OSCE knowledge. If you get someone with a stroke, what other follow-up imaging would you want to do? Crotted US, perfect. Yep, crotted ultrasound. Anything else? So another thing that we do is an echo good, yeah, an echo of the heart. The reason is because you can sometimes get septal defects and that can lead to a paradoxical embolus. So normally they shouldn't really um, go up uh, to the brain given the circulation pattern, but if there is a defect in the heart that allows a clot to traverse, then obviously um, we do think about, uh, so venous clots, what I mean is venous clots going into the brain systemic circulation, but yes, correct. So we also do ECG, absolutely very basic. So to, to look for AF, um, and then that will prompt us whether we need to do any kind of anticoagulation in the long term. Um, so those are the main ones. I'm just going to move on. So what types of infarct patterns do you know about? I'm mainly just looking for two. 
So what if I said I give you a CT head and there was just loads of patchy uh, infarcts everywhere? What type of uh, infarct pattern would you call that? Not quite. So have you guys heard of embolic? So either you can throw up a shower of clots, basically, which can then travel up into different arteries and cause multiple discrete areas of infarcts, which could be lacuna. So lacuna just basically means a small area. Um, and they typically exist around certain key areas of the brain. Um, but it just means it literally all it means is a small area of infarct, which with embolics tend to happen. Um, but the other one is that you can occlude. So an occlusive stroke, which is where you just block off an entire artery in that entire territory. So remember when I was showing you that diagram with the territories, so you've got your MCA territory, your ACA territory, anterior cerebral artery territory, and your posterior one. So if you actually occlude one of the major arteries uh, leading, uh, supplying that segment of the brain, then that entire area can become infarcted, which we then call occlusive. So you've got embolic patterns and you've got occlusive. So um, I don't know if this is going to work. Um, Actually, I think I'm going to skip this because what I what this I will give you the slides for these. Don't worry, and you can actually these are just videos of going through the axial and the sagittal and the coronal sections. The more important thing to look at is actually cases. Um, so, what do you guys think is happening here? What sign can you pick up on? Some I think someone said S A H. Not quite. Not quite. Why have you said that? So someone said ventricular enlargement. So let me quickly explain. So someone, so are you guys saying that because of this? Thought there was a star sign. Yes. Yeah, so basically, what's going on here um, is you have uh, one second. Oh, I think. OK, cool. So I don't have too long left. Um, so what we have here is basically this is actually the region of the middle cerebral artery. OK, this is the middle. So you, you can probably make out this structure that's coming around here. So at this level, what can you see? You can see the pons. You can see the basilar artery. And where you see the pons and the basilar artery, if you ever see two massive structures going across um this these massive fissures the structures that go through this are the middle cerebral arteries and relative to this this is very bright now bearing in mind this is a non-contrast study so this means this is hyperdense mca which basically means you probably have a clot somewhere which is then causing a stagnation of blood within the vessel so if you normally have an appropriate flow going through, it's it's not it's basically the same density as the parenchyma adjacent to it. But when you have an occlusive stroke and you have a, a stagnation of blood within the vessel, it presents as a hyperdense vessel. That could happen here. It could happen anywhere. So this is a hyperdense MCA sign. And what I want to point out, this is actually the this is the let's say this was at let's say one hour, and then let's say this um, is done let's say at six hours. So can you appreciate any difference between the two? I, I appreciate that we're slightly higher up. Um, but what do you think is, is, has happened here? Yeah, so we've got ischemic changes. And the main thing I want you to guys to, to, to remember is on this side, I don't know if you can appreciate this. Someone said edematous. I like your, I like the, uh, the reasoning there. So what we have, can you see on this side, we've got a separation between what we've got a slightly bright area and then a slightly dark area. So this is white matter. The reason why it's slightly darker is because it's coated in myelin. Myelin is lipid rich. And I told you that fat is not that dense. So that's why it appears slightly darker. Whereas on the, on the peripheries, you've got a high concentration of cells. So it's slightly denser. So we've got gray matter and white matter. And we can see the two separated out very clearly. Here, I can't separate out my gray matter and my white matter. 
This is called loss of gray white matter differentiation, which refers to cytotoxic edema. So there's two types of edema, vasogenic and cytotoxic. All I want you to remember is with ischemic strokes, you get cytotoxic edema, and that causes loss of gray white matter differentiation, as you can see here. And this in conjunction with the hyperdense MCA sign is pathognomonic for, uh, in this case, a left MCA infarct. Okay, we're gonna move on. And um, this is just another case of showing a loss of gray white matter differentiation again. Um, what type of hemorrhage is this? So someone's an extra dural. Very quickly, do you know why? Why is it not subdural? Very, very good. I really, yeah, I'm glad you said that. So uh, someone said no midline shift. There, there is midline shift. Yeah, but yeah, so that's the most important thing. So it's confined by sutures. It doesn't go beyond that. And because it's confined to it, you get this bulging because it doesn't have enough space to distribute around by itself. Um, because of that, it's causing a mass effect on the ipsilateral brain. I can then see effacement of ventricles. So whereas here I can see the ventricles really clearly, here I can't see them. So we call that we call that effacement of ventricles. And it's the same phenomenon actually on this side. You can probably appreciate the fissure and some of the sulci, but here we can't see the sulci very well. So we've got effacement of the sulci, the ventricles. And if you can believe me, this is the midline uh, falx. And then obviously, can you see how you've got this bit of brain going underneath here? This is actually something, so this brain should be on that side. This is called a transtentorial herniation of the brain. So there is a significant midline shift. So this, this, ventr this element of the ventricle should be on this side. So the fact that it's shifted across and you've got the falx on the other side means there's a transtentorial herniation of the brain. That's a bad sign. So then you obviously the next step is to look down at the base of the brain, look at the foramen magnum and just see if that's still patent, because what you don't want is the brain to sink down completely and compress the brainstem. What type of hemorrhage is this? Very good. This is subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you can now see we don't just have one density. We've got loads of densities going across in between the brain. So lots of hyperdense. So this is SEH. Well done. Yeah. Um, so the fact that it's more, most concentrated on this side might mean might mean that this is due to a ruptured aneurysm because we've got so much uh, dense stuff here but not so much on this side um yeah does that make sense um and then if we go to the next one what type of hemorrhage is this intracerebral intracerebral correct um, so what you can see is a large focus of, of, of hyperdense, uh, hyperdensity there. And what's this referring to? Edema. Good. Which type? Not quite. So remember I said there was two types. So this is actually the other type. So this is, yeah, this is, this is the vasogenic edema. So whenever you have a lot of blood in a space where it shouldn't be, you get a lot of reactive edema, and that's called vasogenic edema. And sometimes if you've got enough of a uh, hemorrhage insult, you can get secondary ischemia to the brain around it, and that can cause cytotoxic edema. The only way to truly differentiate between these things is on an MRI. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is when you see a rim of hypo enhancement, um, uh, hypo density around, then just remember that's typically in the case of bleeding second uh, caused by vasogenic edema. So this is again causing midline shift. Can you appreciate how this is the tentorium on this side and you've got an effacement of the ventricles and it's being pushed over onto the side? Okay. Now, what type of, can you, what can you see here? Good, this is subdural. The previous bleed was called an intracerebral hemorrhage. This is a subdural hemorrhage, good, well done. So a quick note on this, it for typically forms a lentiform shape, so it conforms to the shape of the brain, um, and that's because it has a lot more space now to, to traverse across. And another thing I want you to remember is, 
you've got bright bits here as well as slightly you know lower uh, not bright bits so dark bits um the reason is so i told you bright uh, bits represent acute uh, blood and then this uh, the darker stuff represents old blood so this is probably a little bit of acute on chronic um compare it to this can you guys see here you can actually miss this quite easily when you're reviewing a CT head. Um, I've been guilty of that. So this essentially is um, a, a chronic subdural bleed. Okay, so it's because it's it's again forming around. It's a small one, but it's forming around. It's a lentiform shape, and it's completely gone sort of blackish. And that's because as blood degenerates, it just becomes plasma. Um, so it's just the same as normal fluid. So guys, um, we'll finish there. I just want to quickly mention, um, actually, I'll let Shuei uh, uh, talk about this. So there's a finals um, course that's going on, um, which I think Shuei will put into better words. But that's all from me, guys. OK, sorry that we couldn't go through everything. So much, Hassan. That was amazing. If you wouldn't mind putting this feedback for me, I just linked it in the chat. That's really good images there. Yeah, stuff. thank you. But those of you still around, yeah, we've got a finals course coming up in January. Uh, if you want to check out the website, by medicine, we're covering medicine and surgery across two weekends. There's an early bird discount, which expires by the end of next week. Um, so if this is something you're interested in, feel free to sign up. We've got, we still do have some places left. Um, so please do go to our website, by medicine um, and something which will interest you. The slides will be up and the recording will be up on this webinar in the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, thanks again, Hassan. That was a pleasure to talk. No worries. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, I hope that was useful, guys. And um, if I get an opportunity to do any more, we can go through the remaining stuff. But yeah, if you can submit feedback on what you guys think, and then I hopefully I can improve for next time. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Have a good one.